evening, everyone. Welcome to AIC's Academic Lecture Forum. If you could kindly turn your cell phones off, that would be great. We will be live tweeting at AIC USA, hashtag AIC Lecture. We are honored to have with us an extraordinary scholar, Dr. Robert Pape. He is a professor of political science at the University of Chicago, specializing in international security affairs. His publications include Cutting the Fuse, The Explosion of Global Suicide Terrorism and How to Stop It, Dying to Win, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism, just to name a few. His commentary on international security policy has appeared in the New York Times, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, as well as on Nightline, ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, and NPR. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1988. His current work focuses on the causes of suicide terrorism and the politics of unipolarity. He is the director of the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. He joins us today to talk about how ISIS changed the world again. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Pee. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, it is real. Oops. Oh, close. Yep, yeah, one second. <laughs> There we go. I think we can do it. Um, it's great to be here. I really appreciate being here. It's my first time here. I'm learning a lot about um, uh, AIC, and um, uh, I uh, wish uh, AIC well in getting accredited. I hear that's coming in the not too distant future. Um, and uh, just thank you all for coming out to, uh, uh, to my talk. Uh, this is really a, a very troubling time, um, and I want to talk about terrorism. Uh, terrorism is um, a tough topic. Um, it's a tough topic because it touches us personally. Um, of all the issues I've studied in my life, um, uh, nothing in my academic life um, has touched people more personally than the issue of terrorism. Um, it is something that when we talk about China, we talk about trade, um, by the way, even when we talk about presidential politics, um, Terrorism really touches us personally. Now, of all the people that it touches, it touches Muslims. It touches Muslims. Um, not in the way most people think. So I am going to tell you a lot about the causes of terrorism. I do not think Islam plays a very important role in the causes of even so-called Islamic terrorists. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot about that, especially with respect to suicide attacks and ISIS. Um, but it is definitely the case that um, terrorism touches Muslims um, in the United States, in Western Europe, um, in a deeply personal way. There is, uh, I've talked to many um, uh, Muslim groups um, over the years, um, and it um, uh, doesn't matter whether it's in Chicago, in Cleveland, in Detroit, or wherever, and really, in quite Washington, D.C., I could just go on and on. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, I know that this is a very, very difficult issue. Um, I think the best way to deal with this issue, um, and I mean even for American, for Muslims, is to talk about terrorism. I realize that's tough. A lot of non-Muslims can talk about terrorism. Um, but um, especially given the causes of terrorism debate, if we don't talk about terrorism, then many of the rest of the world can't hear us because that's what they're worried about. And so it's very important to talk about the causes of terrorism. And I realize that that's difficult for you. That's a difficult thing. And I appreciate being here. So when I say I appreciate it, uh, um, I really do appreciate it because I know coming to talk about this subject touches you and it touches you in a tough way to talk about it as terrorism. So what I want to do is talk about ISIS. I want to talk about it. Um, uh, I've been studying uh, suicide attacks uh, for over 15 years. Uh, I compiled the first complete database of all suicide attacks around the world shortly after 9-11. Uh, I, after I did that, uh, no government had that, no think tank had that. 
Um, and so that uh, database became very, very important to governments, including our government, the American government, to private foundations. Um, and I have compiled and kept up tracking uh, terrorism, and now all terrorism, but especially suicide terrorism. Um, uh, since that point, I have a big research team at the University of Chicago, 40 people. Uh, there are very few professors that have a research team that big, um, so this is, uh, uh, this is not a small little cottage thing anymore. This is a very large thing. Um, if you go to our website, Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism, you can look at data, you can look at things and see the data that's verified. So this isn't just data that you find on the web. Um, this is corroborated, verified data. It's the best data on suicide attacks in the world. Um, and um, we're funded by the Pentagon. Um, we, uh, the data is so important that we've been funded by the Bush administration Pentagon, the Obama administration Pentagon. That's a big deal because we disagree with their policies. <laughs> I've given congressional testimony against both of those administrations. <laughs> All right? uh, and somehow we've been able to continue that funding and it's because of the data and it's because of the work uh, and what it represents. So I really do think that it's important for you to know that. Uh, now, when I started to do this work, I too, right after 9-11, thought Islam was the leading cause of suicide attacks. And I was stunned when I found out that wasn't the case. Um, I'm going to talk about this in the context of ISIS, so I won't give you the whole history of it in one fell swoop. Um, but just know that a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be telling you about and why I think X or Y was what it took to persuade me of the opposite. And that's why I think that it's very important for you to listen to the data. And then you'll hear a little bit tonight, but if you really do, I think want to do the best that you can for your futures, the best is to, to really understand and then talk about the causes of terrorism with other people. And I think that that's really the most important thing that I can tell you tonight. Now, I want to talk about ISIS. I want to talk about the threat that ISIS poses. And I want to talk about the timing of the threat. Um, let me first talk about who is the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, it goes by various names. Um, I'm not going to get into that whole debate. We all know the name of the group, the group I'm talking about. The key thing to tell you uh, number one is uh, the Islamic State is a product um, of the United States occupation of Iraq. It started in March 2003. It set off, <laughs> set off a whole train of consequences, that occupation of Iraq. Um, but the group we're dealing with today, be under no mistake, is a descendant of that occupation. Um, when we invaded Iraq in March 2003, before that point, Iraq had never experienced a suicide attack in its history. After that point, that, our invasion touched off the biggest suicide attack in modern times, suicide campaign. And we are, uh, there was ebb and flows of those suicide attacks. The terrorist group that did not exist when we invaded Iraq came into being, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, because of the invasion, and morphed through multiple transitions into the Islamic State of Iraq. Uh, basically, uh, what happened is, when we went in and invaded Iraq, uh, we destabilized a country that was stable. And the uh, Sunni community in particular inside of Iraq was the group that felt the brunt of that instability. Uh, we did, uh, the American government, have a transitional government. We worked with the, uh, the largest minority group, the Shia, another group, the Kurds. Those areas became somewhat stable. Uh, the, group, the area that was the worst, the most ungoverned space, was the Shia community in Iraq. And that idea of ungoverned space is a cauldron for brewing terrorism. <laughs> um, it sets off all the grievances, all the issues that we could talk about. Um, and so when we did that, we broke that country and we created ungoverned space for about five million Sunnis. They're the group that formed the suicide terrorist group. They did all the suicide terrorism in Iraq. There were many Islamic fundamentalist Shia, 
there are many Kurds, no suicide terrorism. <laughs> They're in control. The group that's not in control were the Sunnis, ungoverned space. That's where all the suicide terrorism came from. And then over time, there was ebb and flows, and I'm glad to talk about the ebb and flows. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, uh, some policies occurred that did bring terrorism down. However, the destabilization of Iraq set off more destabilization, political destabilization in the region, right next door to Syria. So what we think of as the Arab Spring didn't just magically happen out of nothing. <laughs> um, that destabilization of Iraq had huge domino waves. And right next door in Syria was another wave, and another 15 million Sunnis essentially became part of ungoverned space. So what you saw with the rise of ISIS starting in April 2013 when the group officially formed, which is a marriage of terrorist bad guys in Iraq and terrorist bad guys in, in Syria, um, is essentially ungoverned space for Arab Sunnis of about 20 million people. That's a problem. That's a problem. They need to be governed somehow. They need some justice somehow. If they can't get it from their Shia governments, they're going to go to bad guys, just like the Wild West, just like watching a Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> um, nobody likes Clint Eastwood, but they bring them in when they need the justice, you see. So this is, a, this is the basic logic of what we're dealing with. And that whole idea of intervention provoking suicide attacks has happened over and over and over again in the last 30 years as this phenomenon began. If you open any of my books, read any of my articles, you'll see chock full data showing you that 95%, not 100%, but 95% of all the suicide terrorism in the world since 1980 is a response to military intervention, often hardcore occupation of territory. That's a big deal because that tells you a lot right off the bat. There are hundreds of secular suicide terrorists. There are uh, many secular Muslim suicide terrorists, PKK in Turkey, right off the bat. Um, what is different, uh, what is causing secular and religious individuals to do suicide attack, not 100% of the time, but 95%, is intervention, military intervention. Which is why, if you think you're going to solve the terrorist problem with more intervention, it gets worse. And that's what happened in Iraq. We had 9-11. Uh, we thought we were making it better. We made it worse. I always felt that it was patriots who, who did become uh, suicide bombers because it was their country that was attacked. And they happened to be Christian or Muslim or whatever in uh, Sri Lanka or? Yes, patriotism, so this is Eve Marie, she's introduced herself beforehand. Patriotism is a good way to put it. Um, and so when a community is under threat by an other, and that community is facing military atrocities, military problems, then the people who come to defense of that community um, can be just thought of as patriots, even if they're not part of an official country. So that community is not uh, necessarily an official country because the non-state actors are happening within states, right? But that idea of nationalism, patriotism, defense of a community absolutely is motivating the suicide bombers. And um, it's motivating them across a range of other complex motives. There's revenge, there's social prestige. Religion does play a role but not outside of the context of the military intervention very often. So it's not that there isn't a complex set of motives. There are. There are a complex, and we can talk about those. But they all are triggered by that military intervention. So it's not one of those other motives. It's all of them, if you see what I mean. Uh, but back to ISIS. So ISIS is essentially a Sunni terrorist group. It um, is a product of the uh, US invasion of Iraq. Um, and who is ISIS? Who are the leaders? Um, well, we can look at the top 25. And not all of those top 25 are alive anymore, because the Americans and the Westerners have killed a few of them. 
Um, but let's look at the top 25 that existed as of the fall of 2014, to really get a good sense of who ISIS is. Um, one third of those are former Saddam Ba'ath Party military commanders, secular, <laughs> purely secular. <laughs> Uh, Saddam Hussein did not surround himself with religious people. He's not a religious man. He killed Islamists in his country. Um, one third of the leadership of ISIS is just military commanders. That also explains why they're so good militarily. Um, one third are Sunni tribal leaders whose number one identity is not to Islam, but to their tribe. So these are uh, Muslims. These are Sunni Muslims, yes. But the tribal leaders identify with their clan, with their family. That's their number one identity. Um, and that group makes up a third. And then one third, I would say, are religious. Let me not you know, beat around the bush. Let's call them religious. Um, Baghdadi, the official leader of ISIS, I put in that one third. But let me show you, let me tell you what it means when I'm putting them in that one third. So Baghdadi was radicalized in February 2004, we know in great detail, um, when uh, the United States decided to cleanse Fallujah. So let me remind you, and those of you who are too young to remember the history, of what happened 10 years ago. So in February 2004 in Iraq, Fallujah is a Sunni city in Iraq, um, there were four uh, contractors that were killed killed in an ugly way. They were hung. Hung off a bridge. Yes, hung off a bridge. Very ugly pictures of these four people. So the American military, we got mad. And we decided to make all 300,000 people in the city of Fallujah leave in two weeks. We gave them two weeks to leave. Didn't care how they left. And we said, if you stay, it's open season. <laughs> okay, um, so we cleanse the city of 300,000 people. So just imagine trying to cleanse the north side of Chicago and just telling them everybody's got to go. And we don't know where you're going to get any food, any water, none of that. You just got to go. Um, and then the American military went door to door to door to door to kill the remaining people, the so-called terrorists who were behind. Um, and uh, Baghdadi um, uh, was mobilized or radicalized by that experience because members of his family um, uh, were killed in that, uh, in that experience. Um, it is uh, the kind of overreaction when I say that uh, um, you know, terrorism can cause overreaction and can cause gross atrocities and bad things to make the problem worse that happened. Uh, even though we swear all up and down, oh, no, 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 we'll all be calm. We're not going to overreact. No, you can already see from our politicians, I'm afraid, overreaction just right off the bat. Um, and that happened in Fallujah, and it radicalized Baghdadi and many others. Um, and that is, and I'm calling that person even religious. <laughs> so even that take with a grain of salt. Because <laughs> there's no reason to think he would have been in the position he is today without the cleansing of Fallujah. So Fallujah, or, or for, so ISIS, is essentially a three-part Sunni revolt that is occurring in Iraq, and it's occurring as a revolt against um, essentially uh, the Shia governments because they have failed to provide governance, and in many uh, other instances have actually committed abuses. Um, so the ISIS phenomenon is best understood as a Sunni revolt. Uh, there are many uh, foreign fighters, how many foreign fighters, we really can't say for sure. Um, I'm in the business of studying them and tracking them, and I do think it's much bigger than in the past, and I'm trying to understand that phenomenon um, uh, with, a, with a big, re I have a big research project on it. But I can't tell you what the number is for sure. Uh, what I do know is the numbers you see um, uh, are not numbers that can be corroborated. There is no corroboration. There's no database like mine to corroborate those numbers. I've been in touch with the people that put out the numbers. I don't mean the newspapers. I mean the underlying people. They just simply won't give the corroboration. So I can't tell whether or not they're right. Uh, just know that in past conflicts, a lot of the numbers of foreign fighters have been inflated. And we find out later that they're much smaller. So in the case of Iraq, there were claims when the suicide attack started, that large numbers of foreign fighters, well, now that the secret, uh, actual classified estimates have been released, 
It turns out only about 10% of the fighters were foreign fighters. Uh, Thomas Friedman, in today's newspaper, the New York Times, uh, he went to Iraq, he's in Iraq, uh, you'll see he's got a column, and he'll see, he says, well, you know, I was told there were a lot of foreign fighters, but I'm here and all I see are Iraqis. So just take that with a grain of salt when you see that. But I do think that there are um, uh, a large number. The final point on ISIS is what is its goal? Its goal is to control territory in Iraq and Syria. It is de facto sovereignty just the way a state wants to control territory. They want a monopoly of force and exclusive political authority over territory in Iraq and Syria. By far, that's their number one goal. And understanding that goal is what's helped me to predict its behavior. So over time, I uh, track terrorism, and don't just track it in hindsight, but track futures. Um, and um, it's my, the reason, it's not because I have a perfect crystal ball, it's because I'm focusing on the, the goal that matters to the group. <laughs> um, and um, notice that if you think a group is religious and it's religion driving its goal, then there should never be variation in its attacks. If you understand territorial control is its goal, then you can see vary the territorial control, vary the attacks. And that is what I'm going to show you here in the, about why ISIS is doing the attacks it's doing most recently. Why? But in general, that's true about suicide attacks altogether. Yes, sir? Going back to the numbers you were talking about, you said 3,000 Western. Are those Muslims who are growing up in the West? Uh, not or the ones who converted because they were uh, radicalized. By yeah. Them. So so um, um, we're doing so with this big research team. I have a very big research project, um, and we're not generally going to find out the answer to that. We're finding it out in a lot of ways. So uh, number one, um, um, we're systematically studying all the individuals who have been arrested in the United States for ISIS-related offenses. Number two, we're systematically studying all the attackers by, that are associated in one way or another with ISIS um, uh, over the last two years. Um, the bottom lines are, in this, we haven't yet published this, but just the bottom lines are that the, uh, before um, ISIS, the um, range of who became a suicide bomber was already wide. So you, uh, in my work, I say there's no single profile, um, although, uh, half of suicide bombers are, uh, have college educated. They're more educated than their surrounding community. They're better income than their surrounding community. Uh, but the truth is there's variation in both their economic status um, and their um, uh, education status. Um, uh, it's just the variation is on the opposite of where most people think it, the, the, the centerpiece would be. Uh, with the um, foreign fighters that we're able to track and so forth, and the, uh, we're seeing a wider spread still. So in the old days, never, almost never anybody who committed a crime. Almost never. <laughs> uh, now, about 25%. So not 80%, so, it's, so, so we're going to figure out the distributions. Do you see what I mean? Um, very rarely was there a convert to Islam. Uh, there were secular people who weren't. Uh, Islamic at all, even for Islamic groups. Uh, so, uh, uh, but there were um, uh, very rare was there a convert. That was the standout. Uh, now it's close to forty percent, forty percent. So much wider range of backgrounds with people, um, and so um, uh, and we're going to be doing more work to understand what's changed in that way. Um, but that's probably why the numbers are higher because they're drawing from a wider pool of people. So if it was just a single, narrowly super devout who then become the murderously devout and the suicidally murderously devout, then the, the spectrum would always be super narrow and it wouldn't widen. You see what I mean? Right. So this is more reason to doubt that it's the religious commitment to Islam that's the, the red flag. You see what I mean? So what's happening is it's widening way beyond that. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the pattern of ISIS attacks. So I've talked a lot about ISIS in general, and I've talked a lot about the causes of um, suicide terrorism in general. Uh, now, the reason I focus on suicide attack is because this is the most deadly form of terrorism. 
9-11 wasn't just a terrorist attack, it was a suicide attack. That's what turned our country upside down. The threat we have faced and uh, the threat the world cares about, even though they don't say the words, is suicide attack. Ordinary terrorism, just not enough to hardly make the daily news, <laughs> okay? Um, not enough to turn our countries upside down. Suicide attack is different. It's the lung cancer of terrorism, the biggest killer in the category. The average suicide attack kills 10 times as many people as the average non-suicide attack. Uh, it's really, uh, terrorism is a problem, not just on the day when the number of people killed, but with the fear. It causes fear. Suicide attack causes the most fear. <laughs> That's what the big problem is with the uh, causes, of, the consequences of terrorism. Um, it touches people personally. It makes them personally afraid. And the idea that an individual killed himself or herself to kill someone like them, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. That's terrifying. That's the terror of suicide terrorism. You see what I mean? That's why I study it. So it's important to focus on that. Um, that is the heart of the problem. Uh, so what's happened with suicide attacks with the Islamic State? Well, until six months ago, the Islamic State did hundreds of suicide attacks and even many multiple aim point complex suicide attacks, but in Iraq and Syria. That's why you didn't hear much about it. Six months ago, that changed. It changed fundamentally, and I'll tell you the date. It changed on October 10th, 2015, when two suicide bombers struck in Ankara, that's the capital of Turkey, killing a hundred people. A hundred people. Suicide attack doesn't just kill one or two or five, often dozens, often hundreds. That started on uh, the Islamic State on October 10th in Ankara. Why Ankara? Uh, I'm going to tell, uh, yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, let me give you uh, the, the list and then we'll come back. Um, what happened two weeks later? October 31st, ISIS brought down the uh, Russian plane. Now, I had to change this to a Mac. Um, I don't know if I can show you this video. I want to show you the video that ISIS took of its downing of the Russian plane that it released two hours after the Russian plane went down. Um, I gave this to CNN. Uh, CNN refused to show it. They wouldn't, they put me on as the, the, probably one of the very first people when um, uh, they finally declared that this was a terrorist attack. Because I don't know if you remember, this was not supposed to be a terrorist attack. This was <laughs> mechanical failures and all this. Um, uh, but it was, took them five days before the news media would catch up to this. Um, but I just want to see if I can show you the video of ISIS's own video of the shoot down of the plane. Yeah, so I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm not going to have it go all the way to crash to the ground. Uh, but ISIS knew enough about the timing of the attack in order to have a cameraman right there to take pictures when the plane, you saw it, the first explosion, that's the bomb going off. Then uh, about 15 or 20 seconds later, you see the second stuff, that's the plane breaking apart. Um, and um, it was really striking that the news media would not pay attention to this. Um, it's a problem because two weeks later, Paris happened, and had the news media um, actually covered this, there is the best way to stop a coordinated complex attack is to have the population alert, <laughs> because that's how you get a lot of tips. Tips are everything. Um, if you're ever wondering, should you give a tip to the police? The answer is yes. Um, uh, that is, uh, there is no better way 
to disrupt any of these complex attacks that I'm showing you than tips. There's just no way. Uh, surveillance isn't going to do it. Counting on somebody else isn't going to do it. Um, you just need to know that. Um, that is the number one way that this stuff gets disrupted. But um, um, that, was, uh, that killed 224 people, Russians. Uh, next, uh, the Paris attacks. Uh, this happened two weeks after that. 130 killed. These are the, I'm showing you the multiple aim points that were all struck, and I'm showing you the time hacks. They were struck within about 30 minutes. This was uh, weeks, if not months, in the planning. This was tightly coordinated cell phone caught traffic among the attackers during the, the attack. Um, and they are picking targets that are not symbolic. Notice that I'm not saying anything about symbolism. There's no religious symbolism here of any kind. They, these are targets to kill the maximum number of people. They're not sending a message, they're killing people. And that's what suicide attacks do. <laughs> I'm not saying it never gets used for symbolic stuff, but this is the heart of suicide terrorism. Now, I also want to show you the next slide on the bottom. This is um, what a complex suicide attack looks like in Iraq. And I'm just showing you the bottom slide. This is done by our own researchers at CPOST, just to sort of, we do analysis of suicide attacks and the tactical value, not just a few of them, but quite a few analyses. And we did this before the Paris attacks. But you can see multiple aim point attack. You can see the distribution pattern. It's happening within a close period of time. So when I say that before um, uh, October of last year, uh, ISIS did complex multiple aim point suicide attacks in Iraq and Syria routinely, that's what they look like, which look just like what they look like in Paris. Um, and so this is um, a fundamental shift in ISIS targeting patterns. Um, this isn't just what's been happening in the past. Um, Jakarta, January 14th, another complex attack in the international area of, uh, of Jakarta. Complex, multiple endpoint suicide attack. Uh, just a few days ago in Brussels, again, soft targets, multiple endpoint suicide attack. Uh, this is a chart that the uh, New York Times published uh, just a couple days ago, and you can see there were some attacks before October um, 2015, but notice the circles are so small. They're so small because they're not suicide attack, they're not killing very many people. I'm sorry anybody is being killed, but the reason the country and the West are turning themselves upside down is because of the big circles, and that all started um, in October, that period that I'm talking about uh, with those anger attacks. Now, what, why, what's happening in Iraq and Syria while the uh, ISIS has shifted to attacking these uh, in the West? Suicide attacks are going down. They're going down in Iraq and Syria. So what these lines show you, the brownish-orange line is 2015, month by month. 2014, the blue line, uh, is again month by month so that you can track the monthly difference from 2014 to 2015. That allows you to control for weather, other rhythms like harvests and so forth. And what do you see? You see that there's pretty close fit with those lines until October when they're going in opposite <laughs> directions. That is, as the suicide attacks in Iraq and Syria are coming down, that's when they're going up outside of Iraq and Syria. This is strong evidence that ISIS has deliberately changed its targeting logic, not an accident. Um, and it's something that um, I uh, uh, published uh, as, uh, in the Boston Globe shortly after the Paris attacks, saying this wasn't going to be a one-off. This wasn't just a fluke. There's a pattern that is emerging. And we have to expect more attacks like this in the coming year. Um, and I'm afraid that that's what we've seen. Um, and that is likely to still be the case. Now, why is that? Why is, did ISIS fundamentally change its targeting? Because ISIS is collapsing in Iraq and Syria. ISIS is collapsing in Iraq and Syria. So ISIS came on the scene in a big way in the summer of 2014 when it took Mosul. That is a... Uh, um, um, a Sunni town in Iraq. 
And when I say took Mosul, there was no battle for Mosul. They literally drove in in about 50 trucks, got out, and sat down. <laughs> there was no dying, there's no battle. Um, so calling it they took Mosul, <laughs> they just sat down. <laughs> and, uh, but that was, was scary. And why was that scary to the West, just so you know? Because Mosul was very close to the Kurdish area of oil. Oil. Then ISIS started to attack the Kurdish oil areas. <laughs> then it started to attack the, the, the oil, the puddles of oil in Iraq are in the Kurdish north and the Shia south. Not Baghdad, but they're the, the so you don't want to, if you want to expand your state and you want territory and you want resources, you don't want to control Baghdad, you want the oil. Well, that's what they were doing. And it's a bad idea to let any enemy of the West get a hold of oil. Um, it's been a policy of the United States forever to not let the Soviets have oil, and the Soviets weren't religious. <laughs> it's a policy of the United States to not let Saddam Hussein have all the oil, and it wasn't because Saddam was religious. Uh, didn't want to, don't want Iran to get the oil. Some people think it's because Iran's religious. It's just because we have a policy that they can't, nobody can control all the oil in the Persian Gulf. That's true of a terrorist group, too. Um, and it's a problem, because if a terrorist group gets control of even a big hunk of Iraq soil, even if not all of it, that means they can control unemployment in the United States. They're in charge of it. And this is simply not going to be acceptable to the public. Um, so the public is not going to sit there and allow anybody to control unemployment by turning oil on and off. Um, it's just um, uh, not going to happen. And so that's why we intervened and started to intervene. Yep. So you are saying the United States will rule the world and make sure that it will always be on top. Well, there is a there is a um, um, a school of thought that believes the United States wants to rule the entire world and be on top. I take a more middle ground position. Um, I think that it's really not that uh, we are uh, controlling the oil and putting the oil in our pockets. Um, although I bet there's a lot of corruption. I don't doubt that there's some corruption. Um, I think the fundamental issue is that we went through um, the OPEC crisis in the 1970s, where for four months, um, Middle Eastern oil came off the market in the United States. And it was only actually a part of the oil that came off. It wasn't even the whole thing. And that was enough to triple unemployment. That was enough to um, uh, cause presidents to lose office. That was enough to basically create a whole lot of domestic problems of, uh, in the United States. And so I think that, um, honestly, that politicians of any stripe, uh, even Bernie, um, who I like, by the way, so I'm not picking on, on him. I, yes, I like him. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's OK. I, I like him. <laughs> um, um, but uh, I know the people that advise Bernie. Uh, I like them. <laughs> I mean, on foreign policy. Um, Bernie's not going not gonna to let um, an uh, enemy of the West, the United States, control 10% of the world's oil supply. Uh, just not going to happen. At least I don't believe so. And I don't think it's because he he's, he's wants world hegemony. I think it's just because it is just simply one of the areas in the world that is, could really affect us. About global warming. Okay. True, true, true. We'll come to it. We'll come to it. But let me say more about the logic, okay? Which is the Islamic State, what happened in the summer of 2014 is that the Islamic State was threatening oil, and um, the United States, um, the Obama administration, put together a coalition of Western countries to contain the threat of oil. But what does that mean? That means rolling back the Islamic State territorially. Uh, they also try to enlist allies on the ground. That's a two-pronged approach. Western air power, local ground forces uh, from the Kurdish areas, uh, the Shia areas. Um, and um, that policy has turned out to be fantastically successful. Over the last year, the red shows you, the red is all the ground that ISIS has lost, but this map is now out of date. Uh, I'm afraid I'm doing so much work that it's hard to even update the maps. <laughs> um, but the fact is, ISIS has now, as of today, lost 40% of the populated territory it controlled in Iraq in the summer of 2014. 
40 percent. And um, uh, there's an area here, I'm, I'm not sure if the camera can see this. Uh, there's an area right here um, that Assad's forces has just taken back from um, ISIS just in the last week. So, so, when I, yeah, so when I say ISIS is collapsing, they are collapsing and collapsing fast. That what I mean is their territorial control is collapsing. Now, it may take some time before this, uh, this territory disintegrates into pieces. Um, it's hard to predict what's happening, but the trajectory is very, very clear. And I'm sure ISIS saw this trajectory um, starting probably about a year ago. They're watching the map even closer than I am. And you can just see the map shrinking and shrinking. Now, who are the states in the Western coalition against it? France, Turkey, Russia, the United States, Canada, Jakarta, a lot of Canadians were being attacked. Um, the countries that ISIS has put up in bright lights to attack are not the most Christian countries of the world. They're not the most Jewish countries of the world. They are the members of the Western military coalition that are shrinking it. That is territorial control. Um, and this is a problem because this is likely going to continue. Um, I don't think um, uh, that we um, are going to have a different policy in the next year. We, if anything, are going to probably speed up the collapse of ISIS. I doubt we're going to um, pull back. I just don't think that's likely. Uh, if anything, I'm afraid what's going to happen is we're going to grossly overreact. That is, um, right around the time, a year, year and a half from now, when ISIS really does break into pieces, we'll talk ourselves into another crazy war. Um, in the Middle East, which is, I think, going to then have problems of producing more terrorist groups, etc. Um, but over the next year, I'm afraid you've got to be prepared that there are more, we have to take seriously that there will be more attacks against the countries that are part of the Western coalition, and that includes the United States, and that includes us in Chicago. So Chicago is a clear, very important international city. So we're not a teeny tiny backward city. And so this is something that I'm not, I'm not saying this because I want to say it. I'm just saying it that so my, I, my job is to explain the trajectory of the terrorist attacks, to predict them or to tell you what not to do or to do. And what I'm saying is that the territorial aim of ISIS, they are losing, and as they're losing, they're lashing out like a cornered animal uh, against the states that are causing it to lose. And I think that's going to continue, and that's really the, the big picture um, uh, on ISIS. These are the attacks um, that are continuing, um, that were continuing as of last October. Uh, you can see that Russia was involved. Russia was attacked just three weeks after it went in to defend Assad. Um, and the statement by ISIS about the attacks, they claim the attacks, it's all about uh, Russia going in to save Assad. So, so this is not a mystical thing if you just track what the terrorist groups say. Um, in fact, um, it may come as a surprise, but the terrorist groups are often far more reliable in their initial statements than are the, their countries. Um, so it is just, uh, they're not perfect, but their track record is much higher than the first things you hear for the first few days out of a country that has just faced an event like this. Um, but that gives you a sense of what the coalition is doing. The coalition is trying to take ISIS apart, and it is succeeding in taking ISIS apart. Now, what does that mean, though, in terms of the future? Let me just say a couple of things about the future. Uh, first, the future of um, um, uh, the problem of ISIS and other terrorist groups over there. Um, we went through another round of terrorism uh, inside of Iraq um, 10 years before ago, um, or, or so, with a few years before ISIS, and it did calm down. Um, I could go through the details of how it calmed down, but then it came back. Why did it come back? Because we failed, the international community failed, the Iraqis failed to provide good governance for that Sunni community. You see, we talked, uh, we said we understand politics is a problem, but then as soon as the military problem went away, we forgot all about the politics. Uh, we didn't stick with it. Um, I like Obama. I think he's a fantastic president. Um, he dropped the ball. 
he did not follow through politically. Now he's being criticized for military things, but the real criticism was, mil was political. That's the problem. And so we could, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sorry to say, go through this again, where we have a problem with terrorism, we end up calming it down after a period of time when the publics have been scared, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, and then everybody forgets about it. They say, oh no, terrorism's not a problem. And what they don't do is deal with the political issues. And I think that is the number one thing to tell you, is that we have got to take seriously that we need good governance for Sunni areas of Iraq and Syria. I think the heart of that, and I'm glad in Q&A if you want to hear more about how Pete would, would deal with this, um, is building real economic uh, zones, especially of agricultural development in um, Iraq and parts of the Sunni parts of Syria. Uh, this is an area of the world that used to be one of the great agricultural exporters to the rest of the world, fertilizer exporter to the rest of the world. Um, it's no wonder if there's no future <laughs> that people get frustrated. Uh, we see this all over, the Palestinians, so this isn't unique, but we have really got to deal with the political problem, and I think the next step is economically. Now, do, now domestic, one, one second, I'll, I'll come, one second, let me just, now I'll do q and I think, though, that domestically, there's another side to this which is a side that's even potentially uglier than we saw under the Bush administration. So I'm not trying to give the Bush administration a pass. Uh, I understand that many um, uh, good, decent uh, uh, Muslims were uh, wrongly detained. I understand that they were humiliated. Um, I went to care meetings where I saw videos of this happening, so I have no doubt that that happened. Um, I'm quite concerned, though, about what's happening with our presidential season this year. Um, you'll see an op-ed in today's um, Chicago Tribune uh, that myself and my executive assistant published. Um, and it's really, I think, the first time ever I've published anything directly connected to um, American politics. Um, and what it is, is explaining a little bit about the electoral logic about why this would happen. You see, if you go to Google, you can Google Arab Americans, and you'll see there are three million Arab Americans, and you'll see where they live. There's a map where they live in the United States, um, done by the census, you know, just out of census data. Um, and when you look at that map, what are the big concentrations? Ohio, Michigan, Florida, Virginia the key swing states, or states where the victory for the Democrats last time was so small that you could potentially flip those states. So, listen to some of our politicians who say, I'll tell you why I'm complaining about Muslims, because my opinion ratings go up, my votes go up. That, I'm afraid, could happen even more dramatically once their advisors start to point this out. <laughs> Um, so this is something that is not, uh, happens to other countries around the world. We want to somehow believe we're aloof and, uh, and, and so forth. But the electoral politics of this is something that I think is, I'm afraid, we need to be aware of. And this is not something you're hearing from other people. So just go to the Chicago Trib and you'll see some of the numbers I'm, I'm pointing out to you and it's very disturbing. Now, the kind of policies you're hearing about, about having uh, lockdowns in Muslim communities, this is disastrous. This is disastrous. Um, but um, I'm not, uh, it does have lots of uh, civil liberties problems, but uh, I'm talking about it's disastrous for our security. So I'm gonna put civil liberties aside. Uh, I realize that's serious, but more serious is our security. Um, you see, uh, we already saw that the neighborhood in Belgium was basically, if not under complete lockdown, under heavy oppression. And what that tends to do is it makes people go to ground. There are no tips coming to the police. There is no information about bad guys running around. Why? Because the communities are being suppressed. So these ideas that are floating around are exactly the ideas that could radicalize more Americans, they're exactly what ISIS and recruiters for ISIS can't wait for. <laughs> um, they're going down. 
they need help to stay alive, that's the kind of thing that's going to help them stay alive. So when I say there's a domestic issue, it really is an important issue. Um, and I think that's even more reason why we need to talk about the real causes of terrorism. We need to explain that intervention is what provokes especially suicide terrorism. Sometimes, maybe that intervention is worth some of the risk, but this isn't just about religion. And if we just simply say, oh, no, it's not about religion because this religion is peaceful, I'm sorry, folks, but the other, folk, the other people can't hear you. They can't hear you because they're scared. And if you don't talk about what's driving their fear, they just won't listen. They just won't listen. Um, in order for them to hear you, you have to start with terrorism and admit that it causes fear. And then say, why does it happen? And let's look at the data about why it's happening. Um, and the biggest reason why religion can't explain suicide terrorism is because religion is a constant. And this terrorism is ebbing and flowing. And what could explain how can a constant explain change? It just can't. Um, and so that's really the best way to go forward and talk. And I hope you'll share some of this with other people. If you'll share this night with three other people, and you ask them to share it with three other people, and they ask others to share it with three other people, think about the change that could happen. And that is within our power. That is within our power. So thank you for listening to me tonight. And okay, we'll have questions now. I'm sure there are lots of questions, so please, if you could limit it to one, that would be great. I speak loud enough. Me for the for the for the camera. Oh, for the camera. Anyhow, my question was. What about Libya, which also has been um, interrupted by the United States? Yes, ungoverned space. So um, nothing uh, breeds terrorism more than a military intervention which creates ungoverned space. The intervention in Libya in March 2011 by the United States was for an extremely noble purpose. The Gaddafi's 8,000 guys, he didn't have many left, his whole state had disintegrated. So this wasn't a working state like Iraq, it had disintegrated. The 8,000 guys Gaddafi had left were about to bash into Benghazi and probably cause a bloodbath of large proportions. We bombed those 8,000 guys in their, tent, in, their, in their vehicles on the road to Benghazi. Um, and then I think we made a mistake, which is we pulled, at, we, even though we did those operations over about a week, that was all we did. We handed things off to NATO, we stood back, we did not uh, uh, do anything over the next few months. Um, uh, Gaddafi ended up getting killed and so forth, but, uh, and we did some good because in Libya, even though Libya went through a war, it was the, the part of the country before the intervention. The part that we saved never went through that chaos. However, after Gaddafi fell, I think we again made a mistake in thinking that we didn't need to do anything, that we'd just stand away and things would all magically come together. Um, no international programs to provide solid economic support to the country. Um, uh, no real efforts here on the part of the UN to monitor elections in a really serious way. So what we ended up with by totally being hands off was um, letting ungoverned space again take over. And I'm afraid it took a couple years, so it took a little while to unwind, um, but that was a mistake. So the problem here with interventions, even noble interventions, that saved many lives in Benghazi and eastern Libya, um, it doesn't mean that we should just walk away afterwards and hope everything is okay. I think Obama himself would say as much. I just want to say uh, ISIS collapsed in Iraq because of the youth Shia helped the army. But nobody, no country helped them. They say, no, 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 not you. 
so many people, young, young uh, guys, killed every day. I was in Iraq three days, mm. three a month ago. Mm. It's every day they bring uh, this people. They didn't kill. It's like fifty a day at least. Mm. So who's being killed fifty a day, ma'am? I'm not quite understanding. The youth people with the army, ah, uh, the yeah. army against the ISIS, which uh, is Shia. Yes, so one of the big things that's, this is not just a war with the West against ISIS. Uh, in Iraq in particular, the Shia government is also fighting on the ground against ISIS. Um, it is not uh, purely 100% Shia. There are a handful of Sunnis that are also now fighting um, uh, with uh, that uh, kind of growing coalition. Um, but they too are bearing the brunt of ISIS attacks. So what's happened in the last six months is it's not just ISIS has lashed out against the Shia, I'm sorry, against the, um, the West, the Western coalition. They've done still more deadly attacks against civilians inside of Iraq and inside of Syria. But nobody uh, said anything. 150 Iraqi killed yes. by suicide bomber. Yeah. It's nothing. Yes, no, I, no, I definitely um, uh, appreciate that the, the media in the West is not covering it. But what I can tell you is that is also what my the research I said would support would have shown, which is that the terrorist groups don't lash out when they're strong and in control. They lash out when they're shrinking and collapsing. And as they shrink and collapse, they're lashing out against this, the, the opponents. And in this case, uh, you're right, I am focusing on the West too, so I am a bit guilty as well. But it is definitely also the Shia, because the Shia have been part of the coalition against them. Yeah. Um, and that's also happening in, uh, in Syria as well. And that's why the Damascus attacks. We have a question here. Yeah. Salaam alaikum. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the, some of the, verse, it has two parts. Uh, okay. The first part is, what are the, uh, some of the verses of the Quran that they use to justify what they're doing? And the second part is, um, why when they are killing, they say Allahu Akbar? Uh, so um, let me say a word about, uh, so um, we collect, so I now, with this large research team, we don't just collect a few things that are kind of showing up in the news, but we um, systematically collect the propaganda uh, that groups put out, including ISIS and including its, its videos. So um, uh, especially since uh, um, October, we've collected um, the entire universe of videos that have come out from Al Hyatt, the provinces, um, about a, over 150 videos. The videos we don't collect are the cell phone videos, which are made and then sometimes put out on Twitter and so forth. So I can't literally tell you that we have every video, but we have every organized production video that ISIS has, uh, has put out. Uh, many of those are uh, simply not uh, very religious. Uh, many of those um, uh, do not have much uh, uh, Quranic verses in, if any. Um, they are, um, uh, there is a, um, uh, a uh, for people that have uh, paid attention to terrorism, and even Islamic terrorism, uh, you'll be very used to seeing an older style of martyr video. That's the last video will testimonial of suicide attackers. Uh, you'll be very used to seeing grievances listed. Let me give you the list of grievances that the West has perpetrated. Let me give you the Quranic verses that are very important that I'm going to stimulate your duty as a Muslim to respond to this injustice. Um, ISIS has some videos like that. They have some recruitment like that. But they have a whole new style. That's old. There is a new. Um, you'll be hearing more about this uh, from me as time goes on. Um, there's uh, more to tell you. Um, uh, the Chicago Tribune uh, was good enough. So the, the information I just gave you today, um, on uh, uh, December 24th, the day before Christmas, they gave CPOS, my, my center, an entire page in the Chicago Tribune to lay out much of what you just heard. Um, that was a big deal. Um, that took a while. <laughs> it's the first time we ever got a whole page of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, we got to design it, we got to do all the data, it's all the infographics and everything. We have a similar one on ISIS recruitment videos. Um, and maybe they'll do the same thing. 
Um, and you'll see that there is a striking new style. And it's not just about gee whiz technology. Um, it's part of that expansion of going after different types of people. Um, so I understand why you're asking that. It's very reasonable to ask that. Um, but um, what's different about ISIS is that it's less religious than in the past, not more religious. Um, it's not that it's not religious at all. Um, it's that what terrorists are learning is religion doesn't sell, not even to terrorists. <laughs> um, and so what they're doing is they're finding ways to motivate that are based on other goals, personal goals. Um, and so that's the big thing, ma'am, to, to tell you, is that uh, now why do suicide attackers sometimes um, say um, uh, uh, something about Allah or something? Um, uh, why? It's the same reason um, uh, Americans, when they go into battle, if you ever see the movie Saving Private Ryan, right? Uh, you got the guys going through the rosary. You got the guys saying, well, God, please. And these are people that may never have believed in God before in their life, but they're about to die. And you know what? What I got to lose? <laughs> you know? um, and maybe it'll help my, me feel a little bit better, but I've got to go through this. And on Omaha Beach, 10,000 people died. Within about six hours, they got mowed down, and they walked into their death. And many of them walked into their death chanting something religious. Um, so with a suicide attacker, they are going to their death. They are going to their death. They are not making any mistake about that. And in that final moment comes the reckoning with the instinct for self-preservation. We see this in the kamikazes, in their letters, in their diaries. How do you get yourself to go through, and actually, it's not about killing yourself, by the way. It's about how do you do the act that you'll actually hurt and kill somebody else? That's the hard part about the suicide attack. That's what takes the steely nerve. Killing yourself doesn't take much nerve. That's easy. What's hard is the other part, and that's why they say it. Yeah. Uh, even if, uh, even if uh, ISIS lose all the territory, uh, that uh, that leftover territory will still be unable to be governed. You know. So don't you think that will cause, if not a suicide attack, but a something equal to. Uh, uh, insurgency which will continue, you know. Uh, yes, sir. That's, that's like a, a guerrilla warfare. Yes, sir. Uh, I the do. The second part of the question oh, is, yes. is uh, do you see any relevance uh, what's going on in Pakistan? You know, recently there have been lots of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, suicide attacks, or should I say some of the attacks which is causing more deaths than it has been previously, you know. The recent attacks have been, you know, just yeah. a few days ago there was one. There, there was a big one a few days ago. Um, so let me talk about the first answer, the first part. Um, so um, I definitely think that uh, you're, there's a possibility you're right. I think it could take a few years to um, uh, metabolize that way, to, to kind of occur in that way. So it won't be literally the next month, but it could take some time. And that's what we just saw with the rise of ISIS. So before 2013, the number of suicide attacks in Iraq bottomed out. So we had a large number of suicide attacks, then they went down for five years, long, long time, and then they came back. So this wasn't a, they came up and they kept going, they kept going. We did a series of policies, including working with the Sunni tribes, which was the most important policy. So we established a policy of uh, funding um, Sunni tribes um, in order to have them um, have the wherewithal for their own security. That worked great because they were 100,000 strong. Uh, it was controversial policy because by giving them money, they were buying weapons. So just think about this for a moment. The Bush administration is giving Sunni terrorists money to buy weapons. <laughs> okay? And it worked. It worked. That's what I'm telling you. Because what we called that were terrorists were Sunni tribes. And the tribes cared more about their tribal um, security, their village, than they did anything else. And that policy called the Anbar Awakening was super effective. The problem was that when we pulled out our troops, we let the Maliki government, the Shia government, decimate the Anbar Awakening. 
He killed the leaders of the Anbar Awakening. He arrested and imprisoned and tortured the leaders of the Anbar Awakening. And what was 100,000 strong soon shrunk to about 10,000. And those were the Sunni tribes that flipped back over to ISIS. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? So, so we have been through this movie before. <laughs> we screwed up uh, before. Um, and I'm worried we're going to screw up again. And that's why I'm talking about economics. And I'm talking about it after the attacks go down. You see, once the attacks go down, then the news media doesn't pay attention, Congress doesn't pay attention, all of a sudden we have a lot of welfare, I mean, uh, uh, health benefits, you know, so Obamacare, right, was number one, okay. You see, so the public forgets, and the problem is this is not, this is driven by politics, and this is the root of the problem. Now, Pakistan, um, I know the attack um, was against Christians a few days ago. Um, I would count that definitely as a religious attack. Actually, it was not against Christians. I won't say that because it was in the open air in the garden. Well, okay. But it was happened to be that it's a uh, Easter holiday. All right. Um, I, I would uh, I would I would likely code that as a religious attack. So just so you know. So so um, however, let me just say that. Um, uh, in Pakistan, I'm afraid what happened is when we um, 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 started to pour ground forces into Afghanistan starting in 2005 and six. so we toppled the Taliban, we let Osama bin Laden get away so we could go to Iraq, and that is another stupid idea, right? Um, and then, next stupid idea, is we decide in 2004 and 5 to pour ground forces back into Afghanistan, uh, which we didn't have there. So we had a few there, but we basically didn't, we, we kept them frozen low level so we could go to Iraq. Um, and then when we poured the troops in, it not only caused um, suicide terrorism in Afghanistan to explode, but it spilled over into the Pashtun areas right on the other side of the border in Pakistan. And so the suicide attacks in Pakistan um, are Pashtun suicide attacks. They're happening three quarters against military targets. Um, there is, a, it is complicated. It does look like especially um, the LEJ has um, taken out um, um, a religious vendetta against Shia. So um, on Ashura, uh, especially in the last um, um, uh, six years, it is a very deadly day to be in Pakistan and you're a Shia. I published a piece on that in October on Ashura, on a few, around Ashura uh, in, the, in the Chicago Tribune. So if you want to see the data on that, that's a little subset of what's happening in Pakistan. Most of it is the spillover effect. But when I say that there is a corner or part of suicide attack which doesn't fit what I'm saying, I'm thinking of things like the Ashura attacks in Pakistan, uh, which I definitely think are being motivated by the LEJ to go after Shia in Lahore and uh, uh, anyway, places like that. So anyway, that's a large complicated answer to the question. Um, um, and, uh, but I do think that we do need to really be afraid that we'll solve a problem in the short term that will come right back even bigger down the road. Yeah. that when after 9-11 when we went into Afghanistan and Taliban al-Qaeda regime collapsed, one effect of that was terrorism in Pakistan proportion. Yes. Exponentially grew because these people spread in many directions and Pakistan was one place where they could come. So what you are predicting about the collapse of ISIS is it not better that they are there and contained rather than they collapse and then they spread in all directions and so we don't know what will be doing where? Yeah. My other question on a different uh, route is when you talked about terrorism and suicide terrorism and why suicide terrorism is so problematic. Uh, going to the religious roots of that, uh, 
one thing is that we did not have suicide terrorism for a long time, is that Islamic law is extremely harsh on the issue of suicide. So it was not permissible under any circumstances. But when Mr. Yusuf al Qazawi, the great sheikh of Muslim Brotherhood, and with most popular program on Qatar TV, on Islam al Hayat, reinterpreted this tradition and justified suicide terrorism, particularly in case of Israel, and turned it into a kind of martyrdom operation. I think that it has a lot to do with enormous growth, because that psychological barrier of suicide being a sinful act has been removed. Yeah. And I think this is an important factor that it's growing. Um, so I um, uh, definitely think that uh, there is a role for religion in suicide attacks. I absolutely uh, don't doubt that that's the case. Um, I do think that um, if um, the more the society is opposed to suicide, the more it helps to have religious cover for suicide attacks. So I also uh, think that's true. So um, there's, a, there's a lot more to say about that. In, um, in Dying to Win, I actually assess how often different people from different religions commit ordinary suicide. And what you're saying about Islam um, is, um, you're right, of the major religions, um, Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam, it's Islam that has um, the uh, structural, uh, a strict prohibition um, in, uh, in texts. Uh, the others do not. Um, and uh, Muslims commit suicide 25% um, uh, as often as um, Christians um, and 50% as often as Jews. That's just ordinary suicide. So, and that's true uh, in many countries around the world. That's uh, true even when it's Israeli coroners that are counting the Islamic suicides. So that's just really true. You see what I mean? Um, and so your point is very well taken. Where I would just add to that is, first of all, many of suicide acts are simply not religious. They're just simply not religious. And even the religious suicide attackers are doing it in the context of a military intervention or a military occupation. Um, so um, I went to Libya in 2010. Uh, Saif Qaddafi, uh, Qaddafi's heir apparent, his son, uh, brought me to Libya uh, twice in 2010 because he wanted me to interview some terrorists from the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group that he was releasing from prison. Um, and so I did. Uh, he thought he had, quote, rehabilitated them, and he thought if I interviewed them, maybe I would say they were. Um, I don't know that they were really rehabilitated. That's a, uh, I think they wanted to get out of prison. <laughs> they would say pretty much anything to get out of prison. Um, and it was the famous prison just outside of Tripoli that we, were, we went to. But um, uh, I uh, interviewed uh, one, uh, one, several of them in detail for like four hours, so a long time. And I got to hear the story of how they uh, became captured, et cetera. Um, uh, one of them, uh, many of them actually, the people, that, but we'll just pick the one guy uh, in particular. Um, he uh, became, quote, a terrorist in the late 1980s uh, because uh, he wanted martyrdom. And he was very explicit. I want martyrdom. And so um, I went to Afghanistan to die as a martyr. And I said, why did you go all the way to Afghanistan? Because he um, had all this difficulty getting out of Libya that was really tough to do. Um, and he explained how difficult. And he said, well, Professor Pate, you don't understand. Um, in Islam, if I want to be a martyr, I have to die saving Muslims against non-Muslims. And that was the only place I could find them. <laughs> so so I, I do believe, sir, that there is a religious aspect, okay? But I think it is what is called defensive jihad, okay? It is, um, uh, it is occurring in the context of a military intervention or occupation, if you see what I mean. Um, and so that's the point I'm stressing. That's the point I'm stressing. So, um, and I'm afraid I forgot your first point, but anyway, maybe I'll... If you, is it not better that they are contained? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so let me say a word about that. So I'm now discussing with some folks um, uh, 
some, some political leaders have an idea that we should send 50,000 ground troops uh, into uh, Syria to conquer Raqqa. That's one of the areas uh, in the middle. And basically, my argument to them is that's going to be a repeat of Tor Bora. That if we do that, which is so to put that in language that you know you understand. So after we toppled the Taliban um, in November 2001, um, we thought we could easily roll up Al Qaeda, Bin Laden. Um, after we toppled the Taliban, I was very skeptical of this plan. Uh, I heard from the CIA what the plan was, and I told the person, I said, "What? That's just not going to happen." And it's because um, you're setting up a situation where you're very likely to have the scattering you're describing, and you have no way to prevent the scattering. So 50,000 ground troops is going to take months to deploy. Everybody's going to see it coming, and what you're going to get is probably a replay of Tora Bora. Um, and um, uh, so I think a better approach than ground forces is this incremental peeling away of the different alliance pieces that are what we call ISIS. ISIS is not a unified thing. ISIS is made up of three pools, Sunni tribes, Ba'ath party leaders, military commanders, and the, those religious guys, who, who number, you know, very, very small numbers, by the way. Um, um, and so what we are doing is trying to peel that alliance apart. That's the better way to do it. Um, uh, I would um, cut deals with the Ba'ath military commanders. Um, yeah, they're bad guys, um, but I'd be willing to cut some deals with them. Um, I want to support the Sunni tribes again with those economic policies I'm talking about. What I want to do is I want to uh, not just have ISIS collapse militarily, I want to have the Sinus come apart so you don't have as much of the scattering you're talking about. I can't really say zero, but that's the way I think we should deal with it. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you all for your questions. Um, I just want to remind you that next up we have Spiritual Dimensions of Trauma Healing, an Islamic Perspective on April 12th, so please join us for that. If you could kindly fill out your feedback forms, that would be really great. And if I can invite Dr. Ali Yurtsever, President, I'd like to present to you a gift. Oh, that's so nice. Of small you. Small oh, small oh small that's balance. beautiful. Thank oh, you very much. Hang it in my office. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.